everybody, it's Cash. I am back from vacation. Uh, just, I have terrible jet lag, but uh, I thought I better do a quick video because several people have written to me telling me that Biden had been possibly forecasting Armageddon in the near future as a result of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. So I thought I'd take a look at that. I'm not a worrier by nature, but I thought hey, I better take a look at that. So I've done that. Plus the race in Georgia between terrible Republican candidate Herschel Walker and Raphael Warnock. I thought I'd take a look at that. Plus Marjorie Taylor Greene, of course. Plus somebody said, will you please do pictures for a haunted doll? You know, why not really? Uh, I should just say that I was incredibly ill for half of my vacation. It wasn't COVID, I'm told, but uh, if not, it was COVID's first cousin. I was incredibly ill and I was bed bound and I had fever dreams. This is the thing I was going to tell you. You know, when you have fever dreams, they can be quite alarming. These big, swirling, epic uh, fantasies that go through your mind while you have a fever. But these were mixed with my regular pictures and downloads and channeling and they became incredibly scarily vivid at times and they made regular pictures even more dynamic and so on. For example, when I was in Serbia, I went to see this war memorial. It's from 1947 and it commemorates a mass grave when the Russian Red Army went through Yugoslavia, as it was at the time, during World War II, they committed the most horrendous atrocities. So really nothing has changed. Russian soldiers are apparently the worst of the worst. And uh, they committed mass rape and a thousand unidentified bodies were piled in this mass grave on a hill overlooking the River Danube. So when I visited that, I had this vivid picture in my head immediately of a claw going along the valley below. And it just reached forward like that and then reached forward like that again and then again. But as I watched, it turned around and it came towards me, clawed its way up the hill and tried to grab me. It was startling, it was alarming, but at the same time that that happened, somebody grabbed my arm. There was nobody around me at all. Somebody grabbed my arm and tried to pull me away. And that was actually in life, that wasn't part of the fever dream. But the four day sequence of fever dreams was like that too, and was really really shockingly startling. Uh, so that's what I've been through and I'm not well fully even now. I did tons and tons of pictures while I was away. I will tell you what they are but I'm not going to start today because uh, last night I had 11 hours sleep and I'm still whacked out. However, let's move on and uh, I did pictures again for the race in Georgia for the Senate seat of Raphael Warnock. Now, I did pictures for these two, Herschel Walker, Raphael Warnock, back in August. And if you remember, there was that low ceiling and Herschel Walker was walking along and there were slats coming down and he kept banging his head on them. Bam! And then he'd forget that he'd banged his head and then BOW! Another one, then another one. And it just kept on going. Now, of course, the guy is a dimwit. He's a liar in the same way that Trump is a liar. And he committed a whole bunch of gaffes over the course of his campaign, culminating in the most recent and probably the most horrendous lie of all that this pro-life candidate had allegedly paid for an abortion and possibly more than one. Now, because he is backed by six GOP billionaires... There's no amount of shame can be heaped on him to force him out of the race. And the race is really tight. I think Raphael Warnock being at 48% right now and Herschel Walker being at 46%. How can that be? It's just the nature of politics. But uh, I thought I'd take another look very, very quickly to see how it was going. And when I did, Herschel Walker walks up to Raphael Warnock, grabs him around the throat and drags him away towards a bank of lockers, like the ones you see in school. He throws him in there and marches away, fully confident that he has this, despite the fact that he is the worst candidate for Congress in the history of the United States. 
But he is convinced that because he's got all this money behind him and because many, many Georgians are ridiculously uninformed about what's the truth because they watch right-wing media outlets, uh, because of that, he feels he can still win. And he marches ahead. There is a challenge, for sure. It's a bit of a hill leading up to the election. But then there is a bridge. And right at that moment, I thought, oh my God, he's going to carry this. Despite everything that's happened, and despite the fact that there has never been anybody this bad running for Congress, and shame on the GOP for putting somebody forward like this, despite all of that, he might carry it. And he might. I don't do winning or losing. But here's what was interesting. You know, in movies, when somebody has a vase smashed over their head and it shatters everywhere and you go, wow, that must have hurt. It's made of glass. Well, of course, they're props. They're not made of glass. They're made of sugar that smashes into pieces when you touch it. Uh, and it doesn't hurt the actor at all. Well, this bridge was made of sugar. So although it looked like Herschel Walker had a clear road ahead, the road itself, the bridge, was very, very brittle and might collapse at any moment. And if it did, he went down. The whole thing fell beneath him. So there is a possibility, and the polls reflect that, there is a possibility together with cheating and so on that the GOP could pull this off. However, it was very obvious from the pictures that Herschel Walker's options were narrowing and that he was on such thin ice in his campaign that it could go south at any minute. And it's almost like he should expect that. Because when I went back to look where Raphael Warnock was, when well, he was still in the locker, essentially, but he didn't seem phased. And this is the issue, really. What you're dealing with is a party that is promoting itself as one of policy and wanting to do things for the public good. That was the Raphael Warnock end of things. Smooth, calm, intelligent, composed versus another party that simply wants power. And that's why the billionaires, these six billionaires, are backing Herschel Walker. Nothing to do with the good of the country. It has nothing to do with that whatsoever. They don't care about regular Americans. All they care about is winning power and making money for themselves. So uh, it does look as though Herschel Walker could carry it but at tremendous risk. There is a huge danger that the ground could collapse completely underneath him. Now, somebody said, would you please do pictures for Robert the Doll? I'd never heard of it. It's in a museum in Florida, apparently, and it was made in 1904 in Germany before being owned by a kid in Florida called Robert Otto. That uniform it's wearing, that little sailor suit, used to be Robert Otto's own clothes, <laughs> which is creepy in itself. But anyway, apparently this doll, it moves on its own, it pulls faces. If you go out, it actually runs to the window and watches you go. It performs acts of telekinesis, allegedly and uh, has built up quite a reputation over the past hundred and so years. It's a bit like that Annabelle doll in the Conjuring movies. And somebody wants to know whether it was really haunted. Is it possible for a doll to be haunted? And uh, so I thought I'd take a look. And when I went into the energy of Robert the doll, it had a strange thing going around it. I don't even want to put a name to this. It was like a little panel. And this panel was floating around its head, but only to a certain distance. It would go this far and then all the way back again. And then back again, this far, and then all the way back again. Now, as I looked, the back of this panel, this floating panel, had a bunch of cables 
out of it. Not real cables, you know, like metaphorical cables. And they ran behind a set of curtains. Behind this set of curtains, there was a control panel with levers. So that was the curse, the uh, manipulation of the story, I assume. But I carried on following the cables anyway. And eventually, they went into a hole in the ground, like you see in theatre stages. And beneath that, it was white. So I assume that the doll was made completely legitimately. And it's just a normal doll made in Germany in the early 20th century. But then you have these weird cables, which are kind of ominous. Now, I am not throwing out the idea of a curse. Because if you remember the video I showed you while I was away, I apologize for the wind on that, by the way. <laughs> I didn't realize it was going to be that windy. But um, if you remember that video and how prayer energy can attach itself to doors and walls of churches, which I found surprising... It's not unthinkable that if you project enough malevolent energy at a wooden doll or whatever this is made of, if you project enough energy at that, it will take on that energy. The energy of expectation. The energy of belief. The energy of a curse, if it's continued. So, yes, I think it's a regular doll. Yes, I think its image has been manipulated over the years with a lot of imagination. But yes, in light of what I found uh, in that church in Serbia, I am leaning towards the idea that a doll could be infused with negative energy the more people believe that it is infused with negative energy. That's my feeling. I also took another look at Marjorie Taylor Greene, and I have no idea why. She sort of fascinates me the way she fascinates everybody else. I think she has attracted $10 million in campaign contributions in 2022. Her Democratic rival, Marcus Flowers, has also attracted $10 million. So it's a very, very expensive race. And when I've done it before, if you recall, there was that feeling that Marcus Flowers should be confident, but he was constantly looking over his shoulder wondering, where is Marjorie Taylor Greene? How come she isn't campaigning in the same way that I am? There was something mysterious about it. And when he got to the end of the campaign, remember there's all that dark cloud and stuff, which is the time we're going through right now, as you can imagine. Uh, when he got to the end, who opened the door to him? But Marjorie Taylor Green. Now, it could be that because of her horrendous antics over the past year or two, that she is opening the door to Marcus Flowers because he goes, you know, you're such a wretched member of Congress that, of course, I am going to get elected. Maybe it works that way. But I was very curious to see what happened with her. And I went and did her individually to see. And when I found her, she was like one of those little ballerinas you see in those music boxes that they used to make in Victorian times. You know, you open the lid and they're just pirouetting on the spot. Diddle, 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 like that. And they just go round and round and round and round. She was like that on one of those spindles. But that spindle she was on was in a groove in the ground. And it had two ways to go. One of which suggested she put in no effort at all. It was just where she was heading. And the other one was if she did put in effort and she did try to get re-elected and she did whatever she could to win the favour of uh, the American public. Bear in mind they have no policies, these people. They're simply demonising Democrats, making sure that Republicans, while they may hate her would never vote for a Democrat because they're going to be communists. They're going to change the system. They're going to wreck America. They're going to come for your guns. That's what this always is about. Otherwise, Georgians would vote for a Democrat. And so you have these two grooves. And Marjorie Taylor Greene, whichever one she went down, whether she put in effort or she didn't, she ended up at the same place. 
at the foot of this hill which represented the midterms. The groove went up the hill. When it reached the top, it made a sharp left. And she almost came off. But it did feel like she managed to stay upright. If she doesn't, she's out. Marcus Flowers wins. But it did feel like she just managed to stay upright. Possibly because that area she's running in is very, very, very red. But she went along and down the other side, flopping around at this point. This had really been a close call. And then on she went. But for Republicans, this is so important to have somebody like Marjorie Taylor Greene, who is expert at demonizing Democrats. That's what they want. They don't want somebody who is an expert at being a politician. They simply want somebody who is the very, very best they can get at demonizing Democrats, ready for the 24 presidential election. And she is one of those. She is brilliant at getting attention and demonizing Democrats. And so obviously they want her to win. Uh, I also finally responded to a question that somebody had asked me about Armageddon. I was on vacation. You can't just leave me alone without Armageddon questions. <laughs> and I thought, oh, really? Biden's warning about nuclear war? Apparently so. This situation in Russia is worsening. It's coming to a brink point with Putin threatening to go all in and destroy everything. And uh, I thought, OK, let's take a look at the relationship between Biden and Putin. Because if you remember about 60 years ago during the Cuban Missile Crisis, the US President JFK went behind closed doors with Khrushchev and they came to a deal about missiles and uh, that sorted things out and took the world back from the brink and I think people are hoping the same thing will happen here but I thought okay let's take a look at the relationship between Biden and Putin and there they are side by side and the weird thing was that Biden had a steering wheel you know like you give to a kid and they just kind of run around the house going <laughs> pretending they're a car that sort of thing and Putin just regarded him as a silly, doddery old man. What I found fascinating about these pictures was that, yeah, Biden had a little steering wheel. But what we couldn't see, what Putin couldn't see, was that around him there was a bus an invisible bus. This was Biden's military and strategic infrastructure, the team he was leading. And it so reflects those pictures I did before he was elected in 2020. Do you remember everybody was attacking me because I had called him weak? And you went, no, no, he is a collaborator. He listens to the team, but he leads. And you were right. That's exactly how it is. He is somebody who listens to all the various sources of input and information and so on. And then he makes a decision and he leads. He is driving the bus and you don't get to see what the bus looks like, or how big it is, how many passengers there are on it. This is the same thing again. And Putin didn't fully understand how big this bus was. And he happily watched Biden kind of pop, pop, going over the hill and down. Good, that's him out of the way. Now let's proceed. And Putin just marched on. He was totally okay. Yeah, there was a big challenge ahead, a steep hill. But Biden was out of the way. Putin was in control. Nothing could get in his way. He goes up that hill and discovers as he reaches the top that the sky is a lot lower than he'd imagined and solid. There's only so far up he can go before he hits a ceiling. 
And the way forward after that is extremely narrow. His room for manoeuvre is gradually going to decrease. So what about Biden? Where did he go? I went down the hill to see what was happening. And Biden was still holding his little wheel, but his engine was ticking over. The bus was idling. He was waiting for something to happen. And I suddenly understood what this was. You can't go to Putin and say, OK, dude, you're endangering the entire world. Pull back. Because Putin, being a complete psycho, will just respond by going, good. I hope everybody dies. Something like that. And so Biden had realized that if you just set the stage, put all the pieces in place, but invisibly, so you don't quite know where they all are. It's a bit like planting landmines. But if you do that, all you have to do then is wait, let the bus idle away, and Putin will discover for himself what the limitations of his power are. So going up the hill, Putin thought, I'm great. Look at Russia. We are thriving. Delusionally, of course. We are thriving. But only as he reached the top did he realize that the sky was a lot lower than he thought. That the sky is made of wood. <laughs> something the rest of us already know, but um, that the sky was made of wood or metal or something, and that the gap for going forward was considerably tighter than he had ever uh, imagined or foretold. Biden was playing an incredibly strategic game with his invisible bus. Enough that Putin and his representatives on Fox News and, uh, and so on, and in the Re Republican Party, all think that he's some doddery old guy who doesn't know what he's doing. Yes, he appears weak to them, but he is doing his collaborative thing, his teamwork thing, his get on the bus, let's do this together strategy that has worked for him during his administration in quite astounding ways. And that is it. Thank you very much for watching. It is great to be back. I hope you're all doing well. It's certainly far better than I am, that's for sure. <laughs> if you haven't subscribed yet, please do. We have just passed the 29,000 subscriber mark, which is beyond my comprehension. I am so grateful to everybody who subscribed. Thank you. And uh, if you would also like to share and like, that would be fantastic too. Uh, follow me on Twitter at Cash Peters. Uh, follow Olive, who is still in standoffish mode. Can't believe that I went away and deserted her for two weeks. And so she's uh, giving me the cold shoulder. But uh, I'm sure she'll come around. But uh, if you want to follow her, she's at Olive Meets World on Twitter. Otherwise, uh, I'll see you very soon, guys. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.